I am Cynthia. I am a product specialist at Cypress Diagnostics. And today I will be giving you the basic, basic principles of biochemistry. The goal of this presentation is to master the key biochemistry concepts and see good labor laboratory practices. And it also serves as a preparation for future Cypress Diagnostics training admission exams. So when you want to participate in a workshop, we will send you an admission exam and you will have to obtain a score of 80% to be allowed to participate. This allows us to focus on the installation and use of the analyzer during the workshop. Today we will focus on the measurement principle which is used in all our biochemistry analyzers. We will also focus on the daily routine measurements, such as the auto zero, the calibration, quality controls and samples. We will see why it is important to do these measurements. The measurement principle. All the Cypress diagnostics analyzers use the same principle of measurement. A source of light, a source will emit light, which passes through filters which, with a specific wavelength. This light then goes through the flow cell and it is detected by a detector. The intensity of the light captured by the detector is directly proportional to the analyte concentration. The analyte will be contained in the flow cell. So to measure a specific analyte, we need to mix and incubate our sample with reagents. This will induce a biochemical reaction. There are three biochemical biochemical reactions we would like to discuss. The first one is an endpoint reaction. What happens during this reaction? When no sample is added to our reagent, we have a very small absorbance. At type point zero, when sample is added to our reagent, you will see an sudden increase in absorbance. And then specifically for endpoint reactions, we will see that the color reaction will stabilize. And it is in this time point, at this time frame, that we will measure the absorbance of the sample. So the concentration of the analyte will be calculated with this absorbance. The incubation, it is very important. The incubation, it will happen outside of the analyzer when we talk about semi automates like the Cyan Smart or the Cyan Vision. For example, such a kit is um, the Total Protein Kit. It uses this type of biochemical reaction. The second type of biochem biochemical reaction is a two point or fixed time reaction. How is this reaction characterized? You will see when you add reagent to the sample, there is an exponential increase in absorbance, and then we will see a linear reaction. For two point reactions, we need to measure at two time points time point one and time point two, and these absorbances will be, um, they will be used in the measurement of the concentration. So it is a linear curve and the incubation, very important, it happens inside the analyzer because the timing needs to be precise and exact. You cannot do this incubation outside the analyzer. You need to prepare the samples one by one. Third type of 
biochemical reaction are the kinetic ones. Kinetic ones, they are um, characterized by continuous fluctuations in absorbance. You will see you need to measure at different time points. It is not enough to measure the absorbance of your mixture only at two points. This also means that the incubation needs to take place inside the analyzer and you need to prepare samples one by one. For example, this is true for our GOT and GPT kits. You don't need to memorize these charts by heart. We will see them in more detail and we will explain which implications are important. For example, we can discuss the endpoint reaction in more detail, but you only need to remember this. In the calculation of analytes, how do we get the concentration? We get the concentration by measuring the absorbance of samples. We deduct the absorbance of the reagent blank and we multiply it with a factor. This factor is determined by doing a calibration. The calibration, it uses parameters which are known and parameters which are measured. You don't need to know this by heart. It is the software that has these calculations integrated. What is important to know? The incubation, it happens outside of semi-automates and inside automates. What is also important, you will always have to measure a reagent blank for endpoint reactions because this parameter is included in the calculation. If the reagent blank is not calculated, your concentration of analyte will not be correct. What are the implications of two-point reactions? You see the calculation is a little bit different. What is important is that the incubation happens inside semi-automates and you need to add reagents and aspirate this solution immediately. Why? Because the incubation is so important, it needs to be measured at time point one and time point two, it is not allowed to deviate from the exact incubation time. For two point biochemical reactions, the temperature is also very important. In the ideal conditions, the conditions which are regulated by the analyzer, you will have this reaction speed. If the temperature is lower, you will have a, um, a slower reaction speed and you will not obtain the same absorbance for the sample. If the temperature is higher than indicated, the reaction speed will go faster and you will also obtain a different absorbance for the same sample. So you see, we need to have a controlled situation to obtain good results. For kinetic reactions, again, we need to do calculations. The software helps us with this. How do we get, do we get the factor F by doing a calculation for which the concentration of the calibration is known? You will measure absorbances and do this calculation automatically. Important to know for us is that the incubation needs to happen inside semi-automates. And again, when you add your reagent to the sample, you immediately need to aspirate it because these time points are predefined in the methods and they need to be measured exactly and precisely. Also, with kinetic reactions, the temperature is very important. You have in the middle the ideal situation. 
when the temperature is lower, you will have a lower speed of reaction, a different absorbance. And the same is true when the temperature is higher, you will have a faster reaction speed. So temperature is very important. How do we know if the absorbance will decrease or increase during chemical reactions? Well, the symbol of the factor will indicate it. If the calibration factor is negative, this is the indication that the absorbance will decrease in time. If the factor is positive, it has a positive symbol, it indicates the absorbance will increase in time. So that's what we would like to tell you about biochemical reactions. We have included some questions in the admission exam, which are related to this information. I will show you some of those questions. The goal of today is not that I give you the correct answer, but that I guide you through the correct theory behind it. So one of the questions is, how does a too low temperature affect the speed of a kinetic reaction? We show you three possibilities and it's up to you to choose the correct answer. A similar question asked during the exam, it is again related to the factor. A factor is shown on screen and we are interested in the negative symbol before the value. We ask, what does this negative factor mean? Um, will the absorbance of the chemical reaction go up, go down, or if it's correct or not? So when we talk about Cypress Diagnostics kits and reagents, we need to talk about the insert. The insert which is included in the reagent kits. When should we use this insert? The insert actually gives general instructions like um, the stability of the reagents, how you can prepare samples, the composition of the reagents, and it helps you change units. If there are calculations shown in the insert, they are meant to be used with a simple spectrophotometer, the ones where you put your reaction mix in a flow cell, you measure the absorbance, and you manually have to do the calculation. When can it also be used? when you um, measure absorbances, but you want to change the units of the result. Let's show an example. In one of the glucose inserts, we have mentioned the calculation and we also give the conversion factor. Why do you need this factor? All uh, the analyzers of Cypress Diagnostics, they are pre-programmed. The methods are pre-programmed in a certain unit, mostly the conventional unit. If the lab decides he wants to show the results in a different unit, that's possible. But you will have to introduce the conversion factor to tell the device how he needs to convert the units programmed and the ones shown on the result. An example. For the glucose method on our Cyan Vision, we have programmed the method in milligrams per deciliter. However, the lab decides he wants to have the results in millimoles per liter. So the lab can change the unit of the report to do this, the lab needs to insert the conversion factor given in the insert. 
when the lab does this correctly, you will see that the result first given in milligrams per deciliter is correctly recalculated in millimoles per liter. This is correct. What would be not correct? If only the report unit would be changed without inserting the conversion factor, the conversion factor is left on one, then you would see on the report that the unit has been changed, but the value given, the measurement result, is still the one from the programmed unit. This is absolutely not correct in this example. So use the insert for general instructions and to change units. We have taken up the same question in the admission exam. So we hope it is clear how to answer this one. There is another cheat that we need to discuss. It's called the application sheet. What is the difference with the insert? The application sheet is designed specifically for use on our semi-automates and automates. And for each method, we have designed the stability of the reagent, how to prepare the samples, and we also show the configuration parameters. In more detail, for example, for the CN vision, we show you which volumes you need to prepare for each reaction. So for the standard, for the sample, you need to take up this volume of sample and you need to add a certain amount of reagent. What is also given on the application sheets? The incubation time. You can choose sometimes between incubating at 37 degrees or at room temperature. Both options are OK. We also have application sheets for our Cyan Elite 290 automate, and it will indicate, for example, the pipetting type and the incubation times. The difference between the semi automate and the automate is that there is still a bit of variation because some preparations are manual, while on the automate, everything is standardized, everything is automate, automatically done. So in one of the questions on the admission exam, we have asked, for example, what is the impact of using our Sion vision without an incubator? That is one of the questions related to the information about application sheets. We also ask in another example, when two labs perform the same analysis, a glucose test, one does it with a vision and one does it with an automate, can we compare the results? Why or why not? So now we have seen everything about the measurement principle. So we have seen the three different types of biochemical reactions. Let's see the daily routine. The daily routine, it includes doing an auto zero, a calibration, quality controls, and measuring samples. Let's start with the auto zero measurement. What is the function and the frequency of doing an auto zero? An auto zero is used to reset the optical system to zero. It is always performed with distilled water. Let's see the principle again. So light is emitted, goes through a filter and then it will go through the flow cell filled with water and the signal will be detected by a detector. 
this signal is actually um, an electronic signal and it still needs to be converted from an analog signal to a digital signal. With this digital signal, the computer can do all calculations. What is necessary to do this conversion from analog to digital? We need the gain and the offset. The gain is used to convert millivolt signals into counts. That is the gain. And the offset, it is the detected signal when we use a dark filter, when no lights can go through the flow cell and it allows us to correct for electrical noise. What if the auto zero is bad? We have a certain range in which our auto zero results should fall. If the auto zero is bad, it is an indication there is something wrong with the optical system. So the lamp could be used, the filters could be broken, or they could be dirty. The flow cell could have air bubbles. With an auto zero, we can verify the analyzer. And with the gain and offset, it is also used in the calculation of test results. That is why it is important to do an auto zero. When should we do this? Every morning to check the analyzer, after rinsing the analyzer to verify if the system is clean. Usually we say to wait 30 minutes after switching on the analyzer. Why? Because the lamp still needs to stabilize. And we also recommend doing an auto zero at installation of the analyzer and after maintenance. Because when we change for example, the halogen lamp, this can impact our auto zero. What about the calibration? Why do we need to do a calibration? Why is it useful? We will see its function, its calculation, the frequency of measurement, and the difference between a calibrator, a standard, and a factor. Why do we need to calibrate a method? because instruments only do one thing, and that is measure the intensity of light. So you can imagine we cannot go to a doctor and tell him for a certain patient, the detected light is higher than normal. The doctor, he needs concentration results. The calibration, it will transform the absorbances, the intensity of light, in concentrations of the analyte. So we measure an absorbance, but we need the concentration. What is the relation between the two? The calibration factor. You see here the calculation of a concentration. It is done by multiplying a factor with the measured absorbance. How do we calculate the calibration factor we do this with no concentration of the calibrator and the standard. This is actually on the label of the standard. It is indicated. Or for the calibrator, you can find it in the insert. And then, of course, we will measure the absorbance of the calibrator. And this will be implemented in the calculation. We can see it in more detail. For example, for an endpoint reaction, the calibration factor is calculated with this formula. You don't need to know it by heart. And this representation shows what is done in the device. So the device will measure absorbance in time. For an endpoint, we do one measurement at time point one, and we have the absorbance of the calibrator. In the software, the system will know which concentration the calibrator has. It will know the measured absorbance. 
it will implement it in this calculation and we will obtain a factor. And this factor will be used during all measurements to calculate the concentration of the analyte. Why is it important to do a dynamic follow-up of the calibration? So, you know, reagent can age, the lamp can age, the system can become a bit... Um, there can be variations between batches of reagents, the equipment can age. We will show in an example what happens when the reagent deteriorates. The gray line is when the reagent is still good. When the reagent is not prepared well or deteriorated, you will see for first that the reagent blank will increase. It increases and the reaction is not complete. This translates in an incorrect factor. The gray line is a good factor with reagent which is still um, valid and the invalid factor will be used for all concentra concentration calculations afterwards. So the results of patient measurements will not be correct. So we need to do a calibration at regular intervals. When do we need to do it? After installation of the analyzer and after maintenance, when performing a new method and for each method separately, when using a new reagent plot or a new working solution, and when the quality control is out of range. Doing a calibration in these intervals will improve the accuracy of the results. What we still need to discuss is the difference between a factor, a standard and a calibrator. So basically all three of these have the same function. They are used to change absorbances into concentration results. But a factor, which is given in the insert sometimes on paper, this factor is less accurate than doing a calibration with a standard or a calibrator. Why? Because performing a calibration with a standard or calibrator, it will take into account the characteristics of the test. It will take into account the batch of the reagent, the lot of the reagent. It will take into account the conditions during the measurement, for example, the temperature. It will also take into account the pipetting. So a factor on paper is less accurate than standard or calibrator measurements. What is the difference between standard and calibrator? The standard is actually water-based. It is less viscous than a calibrator. Calibrator is based on serum. So it is more like a real patient sample. And that is why a calibrator is more accurate than a standard and a factor. This already concludes the part about calibration. Let's see why we need to perform quality controls on a daily routine base. We will discuss the function of quality controls, when to measure them, and what to do when the quality control is out of range. So a quality control, it is actually the only way to check the handling and the condition of the analyzer. So it will indicate if the reagent is still good for use. It will indicate if perhaps um, there are some contaminations during the manipulations it will also indicate if your calibration factor is correct. And lastly, we will use quality controls to check our analyzer. And this 
will all result in good credibility and reputation for the patient, the doctor and the distributor. Because you will show that by doing all these verifications, you can produce correct results and that the lab knows how to do correct procedures and how to work with the equipment. What is the consequence of not doing quality controls? Not doing quality controls, then you have no proof that the patient results are reliable. How can we monitor quality controls? You will see in our newest systems like the CN Vision and our CN Elite that we use Levi Jennings charts. Levi Jennings charts, they are used to monitor the accuracy and the precision of quality control measurements. What is the accuracy exactly? The accuracy, it will look at the closeness of the measurement results in comparison with a target value. The precision, on the other hand, it will look at the closeness of measurement results in comparison to each other. So let's look at a Levi Jennings graph. It will make things easier to explain. On a Levi Jennings graph, you will see the concentration of your measurement and it will be indicated in time. So in this example, I measured five quality controls, the same lot of quality control on five consecutive days. And for the five measurements, I obtained almost exactly the same results. You see it here, the five dots are on one line. But I can also verify each black dot against the green line. The green line is my target concentration. It is the known target indicated on the insert of the quality control. You see, when we compare the black dots to the green line, that our results are a bit distant. So the target is 92 and we obtained five times 83. This means that the quality control measurements are not so exact. They are precise when we compare them to each other, but not exact. What does this Levi Jennings graph tell us? It could indicate that the calibration factor is not good because otherwise we would expect all the black dots on the green line. What can the Levi Jennings graph tell us? Also, in the next example, we see that the results of the quality control shift. At first, they are around 200 in concentration. And then after 14 days, we see that the concentration increases. This is very bad. This might indicate that our reagent is not good for use anymore. It is deteriorated. So that's how you can read Levi Jennings graphs. We also included some questions in the admission exam regarding Levi Jennings graphs. This is such an example. We show four charts and we ask you each time, what can you tell us about the accuracy and the precision? So when should we measure quality controls? We measure them at installation of the analyzer and after maintenance for new methods and each method separately. Of course, when we change the reagent lots or we use a new working solution, and it also depends on the legal requirements of the country. The first four points also indicate you need to do a new calibration. And we recommend to do it every day before the analysis because it will indicate you if you are good to go 
if the system is clean, if the reagent is good for use, if the calibration factor is good, it is very important. We also integrated this in the admission exam and we ask you, um, when do you think quality controls should be used in four different cases? What is the best option? So, what should we do when the quality control is out of range? Of course, we first need to investigate the reason. Is it due to something wrong in the manipulations? Did we not store the reagent correctly? Is there contamination? We also need to verify the analyzer. The reagents can also have an impact, so we need to check it out. And we also need to know if the calibration was correct. We actually have some tools at your disposal on our website. We have it for the CM Vision and the CM site. And it is a form which asks some simple questions and will guide you to the solution. So if something is wrong with a blank measurement, you can use this tool to help you solve the problem. What is the consequence of a quality control out of range? Consequences you will have to recalibrate and remeasure the quality control to verify the calibration. This already brings us to the last slide about quality controls. Samples actually, um, their preparation is indicated in the application sheets. It is specific for each method. So the only thing that we can discuss is what should we do when the sample has a low value or high value compared to the reference range? Sometimes after a result, the L of low and the high, the H of high will be indicated. Does this mean there was something wrong with the analyzer? No, it just means the patient is sick. We also integrated this in the admission exam. We ask, we give information. We give information that a good calibration was obtained and the quality controls are in range, but the patient results are flagged. What should we do with the information given? Today we have discussed the measurement principle. We have discussed the auto zero and what happens when it is out of range. We have seen the importance of the calibration why we need to do quality controls, and then we can judge the sample results. So if we follow the daily routine in our measurements, we do this with trained and qualified staff, and we also do preventive maintenance. This all will guarantee the scientific validity of the clinical results. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was very useful. And I wish you a very nice day. Bye. Thank you.